And we're back. Welcome back and happy Thursday. Today, we will finish up our treatment of the link layer. But before we begin, some administrative bits. The final exam period for this class will be Tuesday, 4th of May, in the block of time from 10.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Now, half of you will be giving presentations during this period, and the other half will be doing screencasts recording of your presentation because of the too large a number of students in the class. And so I will notify you as to which one of you have been randomly selected for screencasts. If you volunteer or really would rather do the presentation, um, I will let you choose unless you volunteer to do the screencast. That's fine. So I'll take volunteers for screencasts. Otherwise, I will pick people uh, for the recording and half of you will present. The final exam presentation submission will be the night before, 11.59.59 seconds p.m. That will be your slides and a screencast, if you are selected for screencast. And the final project itself is due on Friday, the 7th of May, at 5 p.m. Please note this is 5 p.m. and not 11.59 to 59 seconds. Project number five, which is Wireshark on IP, and Ethernet ARP is due Friday, the 23rd of April, this Friday, at 11.59 and 59 seconds. Please mark your calendars. So why don't we begin? When we last left off, we talked about selective forwarding, which is what switches perform in getting a frame from one incoming link to some appropriate learned link. And this is the scheme. If you find an entry for a destination MAC address, you forwarded out the link associated with that entry in the forwarding table. If there's no destination, you flood. Otherwise, you drop the frame. You never forward it along the link from which it originated. So let's take a look at this forwarding example where we last left off. We have host A prime, A, B, B prime, C, and C prime on a six port switch. And so we have A sending to MAC address A prime. So source MAC address is A in the frame. Destination MAC address is A prime. It comes into the switch, sends it along its spoke. The switch sees that source MAC address along link one was MAC address for A. So it writes to reach A, you use interface one, sets a time to live field of 60. So then it looks up the destination MAC address in the switch table and finds there is none, so it performs flooding. Now, a copy of this frame goes to every host on the switch except for A, and all of them except for A prime see that the destination MAC address is not theirs. A sees that it is its MAC address, picks up the frame, pulls it into memory, and unwraps the datagram. It sends an act in the reverse direction due to the transport layer. And so then A prime sends a frame into the, the switch. The switch sees that source MAC address A prime sent that in through interface four or port four. So it writes down in the switch table that MAC address A prime is reachable on interface four with a time to live of 60. So then it looks up destination MAC address A and it sees it's in the switch table, it uses interface one and does the selective sending of that frame through interface one. So let's continue on. Now, self-learning switches can absolutely be connected together. So here's a switch S1 with hosts A, B, and C connected to three of its ports. And let's say we connect one of those ports for switch one to another switch S4. And S4, one of its ports is connected to another switch S3. And then the other port on S4 is connected to switch S2. So here we have a set of switches S1, S2, S3, and S4. And switches S1, 2, and S3 have three hosts each, A, B, and C, D, E, and F, G, H, and I. And so you can absolutely interconnect switches to build a bigger and bigger and bigger network. And all of these hosts do not see any of these switches. They believe that they're connected on a shared medium. And self-learning switches, the self-learning works 
regardless of whether you have hosts or you have switches connected to switches. And so one question is, what happens if you're sending from host A to host G? How does switch S1 know to forward a frame for host G using S4 and S3? How? Well, self-learning. It's exactly the same as a single switch case. And so let's take this example and we'll actually follow along what happens in the switch table for each one of our switches, S1, S2, S3, and S4, when a frame, for example, is sent from host C connected to switch S1 to host I connected to switch S3. And then I responds back to C. So let's walk through this step by step. So here, let's draw switch table. Let me set my pen. Let's write out switch table for S1. Let's write out switch table for S1. And that's going to have a MAC address. And it's going to have an interface. And we won't draw the time to live field. And so with this switch table S4, we have similarly, here's a MAC address, and here's an interface. Likewise for S3, we have a switch table, MAC address, interface. Uh, and then here we have another switch table. Let's write it down here. We have MAC address, and we have interface. And so let's number these interfaces. Let's call this interface 1, 2, 3, 4. Interface 1, 2, 3, 4. Interface 1, 2, 3, 4. And lastly, interface 1, we're not using 2, 3, and 4. So we start out, we send a frame from C to I. So in this frame, the source MAC address, this is source, this is destination, is going to be the MAC address for C and the MAC address for I. So now C sends this to the switch, and the switch then writes, okay, if I want to reach MAC address C, I'm going to use interface 4 because it got that frame on interface 4. And it doesn't have an entry for destination MAC address I, so what does it do? It floods. So it sends a copy here, here, and here. Now, of course, when it goes to A, B, and C, it gets dropped because it's not the destination MAC address for A or B. But this frame that makes its way here with source MAC address C, destination MAC address I, makes its way to switch S4. Now, when this datagram, or frame rather, comes into switch S4, it sees, oh, source MAC address is C, and it came in on port 2. So it writes, C is reachable on port 2. So then when it gets it, it says, all right, well, let me look up the MAC address I, which is the destination MAC address. I don't have that entry. So it sends it out here, and it sends it out here. So now we have a copy of this source MAC address C, destination I, going down this link, link 4, out port 4, on switch S4. And we also have a copy coming down here, source MAC address C, destination I. So when it gets here, it, this switch S2 does not have an entry, so it floods. So it floods here, here, and here. The destination MAC address I is not any one of these, so they just drop it. But one of the things that switch S2 writes is that, oh, well, the ingress was port 1, and it was source MAC address C. So if I want to get to C, I use port 1. So now this last frame that goes out port 4, it goes along to switch S3. S3 gets it and says, oh, well, the source was MAC address C, and it came in on port 1. So I'm just going to write that entry. So now S3 looks in its table, does not find a destination MAC address for I, so it sends a copy down here, here, and here. Now host G and H says, well, that destination MAC address is not me, so it can't be mine. But I says, wait a minute, that's my MAC address. So it picks it up, and it unwraps the datagram from the frame and sends it to the network layer. So let's imagine... I then, as the question states, uh, responds back. So what does I do? It sends a frame to the switch, 
and now the source MAC address is I, and the destination is C. So now S3, it gets this source MAC address I along port 4. So it says to get to I, I'm going to use port number 4. So now once S3 gets it, well, it looks for C as the destination MAC address looks it up and says, hey, wait a minute, I send out port 1. So it sends that out port 1, and now that source MAC address I, destination C, is now along that link. It goes into port 4 of S4. It gets that, and it says, oh, wait, the destination MAC address is C. I have that in my table. Let me forward it out too. So then it sends it out here. And so now I have that frame with source MAC address I, destination MAC address C. It comes down into switch S1. S1 gets it and says, oh, wait, I have that C. Let me look it up. It goes out port 4, sends it out port 4, and now this frame with source MAC address I, destination MAC address C, gets sent directly to host C. It picks it up. It unwraps the datagram, sends it to the network layer above. Okay, and so that's just an example of how the selective sending and flooding constructs these switching tables as a consequence of traffic coming in a certain ingress port. And this lookup it does flooding if it's not there. If it is there in its um, switching table, it forwards it selectively out that particular link associated or interface associated with the particular MAC address entry for the table. Okay, and so there we have it. So this is a typical institutional network like you might find on campus. You have your external network, and then you have the autonomous system uh, for our campus. You have a gateway router at the border, border gateway router. It's just drawn here as one, but it's usually more than just one router in the network for DSU. And this router is connected to uh, some high-performance switches. You might hang a mail server off of it and a web server off of it. So this would be desu.edu. Certainly, our mail server is not hosted here. It's um, a Microsoft product. Uh, but then from that switch, you have other switches. You can connect switches together. And these might be individual departments uh, served off of those switches uh, at the lower part uh, of our institutional network. Now, of course, if you send traffic from one host to the other, we said that that flooding happens, so you're going to see all traffic in all parts of the network uh, emanating from that top-level switch. But that can be a little bit of a problem sometimes. Uh, so let's take a look at the comparison between switches and routers. Now, they both store and forward packets. The router examines network layer header information, and uh, it is therefore a network layer device. They store and forward datagrams. Uh, switches, on the other hand, are link layer devices, layer two devices. They examine the link layer headers and forward, uh, or rather process based on uh, those link layer headers. And so for switches, they both have a type of forwarding table. Routers compute the tables as a result of the convergence of the routing algorithm, be that uh, link state routing or distance vector routing, and it uses the IP addresses for the switching decision. And then switches, uh, they learn their forwarding table using flooding and selective, uh, this learning and this selective forward. And it uses MAC addresses to key in on this or index the switching table. And so they're similar, but certainly not the same. They use different header information and correspond to different layers in the five layer internet stack. So, Let's take a look at a really important concept as you scale to large networks, such as institutional networks. And this is called virtual LAN or VLAN. Now, of course, let's think of a typical setup you might have on campus. Maybe you have computer science, you have engineering, uh, you have maybe humanities or whatever on different switches uh, serving up uh, the connectivity for the local area networks for the respective departments. And so let's say a computer science user moves his or her office to the electrical engineering department, but still wants to be on the computer science network, wants to connect to the computer science switch. Now, one of the practical problems is that in this arrangement that is depicted, you have what's called a single broadcast domain. So that means all of the layer two broadcasted information, that's DHCP, uh, that's ARP queries and ARP responses, they're all gonna see across the entire local area network. 
Now, certainly this detracts from efficiency because if you have all this broadcast data, let's say a lot of uh, traffic is happening on computer science part of the network, that's going to let broadcast traffic propagate to all the other departments, even though that traffic isn't for them. That also introduces privacy and security issues. Now, suppose you know one of these departments is payroll. There's some sensitive information or, medic, uh, or, or health services. There's medical records and other types of other sensitive information. So you don't want all of this broadcast traffic making their way to another part of the network if it doesn't concern that part of the network. It, it, it introduces security and privacy concerns. And so enter a virtual LAN. What a VLAN is, or a virtual local area network, it's typically these rack-mounted enterprise-grade switches. That's one thing you pay for when you pay thousands for an enterprise-grade uh, switch, is you get this virtualization capability. And so switches that support VLANs can be configured to define multiple virtual LANs. And so on a single device, it looks like it's multiple separate switches. And that's the beauty of these VLANs, and that's what you're paying for when you pay for these so-called enterprise-grade features. And so there are different types of VLANs that you can establish. One is port-based. Now, in a port-based VLAN, programmatically through a management console, you set up which ports belong to which switch. And so in this example, we have a 16-port switch, and port numbers 1 through 8 are designated as the electrical engineering VLAN, and port numbers 9 through 15 are specified as a computer science VLAN. Now, of course, it's the same device, but it acts exactly like you have two separate switches. And so the broadcast traffic on ports 1 through 8 never make their way to those hosts that are connected to this virtual switch, uh, which are associated with ports 9 through 15. 15 or through 16. All right, so this is what a VLAN is. And so one of the things that these VLANs afford you is so-called traffic isolation. And so when these ARP queries occur or when uh, all of this traffic occurs for maybe DNS or you know things like that, um, this broadcast traffic does not make its way off of the virtualized LAN you specified based on these port numbers. And so you can assign port VLANs by port numbers. You can also do it uh, based on MAC addresses for the endpoints. So you can say these MAC addresses are on, comprise the electrical engineering VLAN or the computer science VLAN. And so this programmable ability is really, really powerful that allows you to pay for, say, uh, a, a, mo a large number of ports on a switch device, and you can slice it up as much as you want to or however you want to to give the same um, behavior as if you had a lot of different switches. And so that broadcast traffic stays on the virtualized LAN. So another thing that can happen is dynamic membership. And so if somebody decides to move from the computer science VLAN uh, to another LAN, and let's say physically that means they're plugging into a different port, you can just change that port programmatically to, as belonging to computer science and the problem. And so you can dynamically assign ports, not just blocks of ports, but arbitrarily ports one at a time. And now then, if you wanted to connect these two networks together based on these VLANs, you would then need a router to store and forward datagrams from one local area network on one VLAN to another local area network on another VLAN. So these specifically act like different switches, but this association of ports to switches is done programmatically through a management console. Now, many devices uh, include a router implementation along with the virtualized switches, so you can form a complete package uh, for how you build these networks that are interconnected uh, through the router portion of this device. And so you can also have a VLAN implementation that spans more than one physical switch device. So let's say you have two switches, switch on the left and switch on the right, and they're both VLAN enabled. Now you can daisy chain physically these two different devices and then associate their individual ports uh, programmatically with these VLANs. And so for the switch on the left, we have electrical engineering and computer science VLANs, and EE VLAN is ports 1 through 8 and ports 9 through 15. 
So then you have a specialized port called a trunk port, and that trunk port is used to chain together those two switches, and they will behave as if they are a single programmable switch. And so now then you can take ports on the second switch on the right-hand side, and you can associate some of those ports with some of the other ports on the same VLAN, even though they're two physical devices. Now, underneath the covers, there's a lot of data going back and forth between these two physical devices, and that's the whole purpose of this trunk port. You just connect them together, and so now you can have one of these boxes, say, in Grossly Hall, and the other of these boxes in Mishu Science Center North, and it will act as if you can select, you know, belonging to mathematics or belonging to computer science virtualized land. And you can also route in between as well. So you can set up that router for the device that's on the left-hand switch or a router that's on uh, the right-hand switch. Okay. So let's take a look at data centers. Data centers are really, really important and increasingly so. And in a data center, the name of the game is density. You want to have as much computation jammed into a relatively small space. So you can have tens to hundreds of thousands of hosts, and they're coupled and in very close proximity, and they're typically used for all sorts of uh, applications, cloud-based applications, from e-commerce like Amazon, content servers, uh, even application servers. So they have stacks uh, that allow you to implement certain types of database applications or other application frameworks. Now, of course, there's a big challenge if you stand up a data center. You have lots of different applications uh, serving a massive number of clients. And so people connect with some client, uh, submit their incoming requests. Some requests might be, for example, to run a regression model or to amortize a spreadsheet or to draw a, a Google Maps street view, do a drive through all sorts of things. And so the other thing you want to make sure is that you're making full use of all of this hardware that you have in the data center. You don't want one machine instance to be sitting idle while the other is very close to being overworked. And so you want to balance your load or all of the tasking on each one of these CPUs as well as make sure that your flows going across network paths on your data center are not being congested along one flow where the other flows are only lightly loaded. So you want to eliminate networking um, bottlenecks uh, as well as balance the load among each one of your server instances. And so depicted here is the inside of a data center, and one of the things that had become popular at one point is to take shipping containers and uh, outfit them as data centers that you can then uh, attach power and network to and drop it down, say, in a warehouse or next to a building, and it was a way to have a kind of modular uh, networking. They even have ones that are submersible under water. And the idea is that all this water around it would provide cooling. All right. So this is an example uh, architecture for a data center. You have the internet side of this data center. And then you have your border gateway router uh, pushing incoming traffic from the internet onto uh, the data center's network. Uh, you other have other access routers, and these routers will store and forward uh, the incoming datagrams off the Internet from the border gateway to other parts of your data center. Now, typically, you have a machine designated that's called a load balancer. Now, this load balancer takes the incoming request, and it also receives regular instrumentation measurements of the status of different host instances in your data center. And it's the job of this load balancer to decide which server instance is going to be the one that's assigned this request by uh, the client machine. And so this load balancer has access to a switch, and this switch uh, is subdivided uh, into other switches uh, that then connect to other switches. And you'll notice each one of these stacks uh, is a server rack, like one of those 42U server racks that we talked about. Now, at the top of each rack is something called a TOR switch, a top-of-rack switch. And it's the job of that top-of-rack switch uh, to form the network, uh, the local network, to, that connects together in a hub-and-spoke topology, the star configuration we talked about before, for all of those 42, uh, 1U or you know, uh, 21, 2U, uh, but all of the server instances that you have in this 42U rack are connected by this top of rack switch. Now, of course, what this hierarchy hierarchy affords you is the ability uh, to set up different data flows either within a, a rack or 
across a rack to an adjacent rack. Now, of course, when you think about how you distribute your load, you might organize your racks in a number of different ways. One way is to have each rack is what I call a specialist. Suppose you have an e-commerce application. You have your database server, and that database server is what stores all of the inventory and things like that. And then you have perhaps a content server, and that content server has pictures of things. Um, and then you might have another server, uh, and maybe that's something called the payment silo. And that's the thing that handles the financial transactions. And so in a specialist configuration uh, for your data center, you might designate each rack for a single purpose. For example, you might have this rack has your database servers. This rack has your payment silo. And this rack has your content. Now, in doing so, when you have an application, here's your application server. Now, your application server, that request comes in from the load balancer, hits the application server, and the application server knows it needs to access the database, so it goes up to this tier two switch, across to a different rack, down to the database. It pulls an inventory level, and then it goes back up, gets that to the application. Application then says, let me fetch the content to show you a picture of what that item looks like. So it goes off, off rack to the tier two switch, down back to the tier two switch in this part of the data center to get the content, fetches that back to the application, and then presents that back through uh, the border gateway back to your browser. So now when you click buy, it comes back in, goes back to the application server, goes up to the tier two switch to get off rack, down to the payment silo to do that transaction settlement, and then you get your receipt back returned through the load balancer across the internet uh, through uh, to your browser. And so that's the whole specialist architecture where you have each rack is a set of specialists. Another is you could have a generalist, generalist type of architecture. In a generalist architecture, let's say, on point to the left-hand side, you have these two units, that's your database, and then these two units, that might be your payment silo. Uh, these uh, uh, server instances in the rack, that would be your content, and then these uh, would be, say, your application. Now, in that case, when your request comes in, the load balancer pushes that request off to this rack, and now that particular computation hits your application server, and it only stays within rack using your Tor switches, your top of rack switches, to go from the application to the database, back to the application, and then the application to the content, back out through the load balancer, you click buy, come back in to the application server, application server goes to the payment silo, settles the transaction, and sends you back the receipt back out. Now, of course, there are benefits and drawbacks to each one. With the generalist uh, data center architecture, uh, all of your traffic stays within the rack, but the problem is if you have a lot of transactions coming in, you're going to concentrate them in one rack and then cause a lot more traffic bottlenecks potentially uh, here as well as here. But that computation, those interactions between the components within that process, they're localized within this particular rack. Now, of course, with the specialist, these racks only perform a single function. And while you do not spend as much time within a rack, um, the drawback is that you're spending more messaging going across the tier two switch to send your computation back and forth across uh, the other specialist instance. Now, the good news is that you can now designate this rack with highly specialized hardware that are beneficial to the app, beneficial to databases. Maybe these have fast 
across that load as well as minimize on uh, congesting uh, any one pathway through the dentist data center more uh, than others. And so here's an example incoming uh, workload request comes in through the internet, through the border router, through the uh, access routers into the load balancer. The load balancer then shuffles or ushers that request to a server instance. The response uh, is that the application contacts another server in the data center. It gets that result from the data center, aggregates it, sends it back to the load balancer, and back out to the application. And you see that in your browser or your client uh, console. All right. And so you can also add another set of rich uh, interconnects among your switches uh, in order to have redundant pathways. And so here we have our tier two switches. And instead of having this hierarchical organization, we have more of a peer connection. Every tier one switch is connected to every tier two switch. So what this does is gives us alternate pathways between racks if we're going to go off rack to another rack in another part of the data center. And so here, this particular rack could go here to the tier two switch here, and it can go over here to get to that other instance. But if you had another instance in the same rack, another server, that wanted to get to another instance, you can direct that flow, for example, here up above, and then across, and then down to get another pathway to try to spread that load. So you can have redundant links uh, between your switches, the tier one and tier two, in order to build redundancy in the path to try to distribute that load and therefore reduce the potential for network congestion in your data center. Okay, so let's end with this and we'll look at a day in the life of a web request. We've now covered top to bottom all of the components from the application layer to the transport layer to the network layer and now the link layer. So we're going to put all this together and talk about a day in the life of a web server request. You come in and you have your machine, maybe you're on the school network, and the school network is described in Siderize notation as a subnet, and you have a gateway router that gets you, for example, to Comcast network. Now, somewhere on Comcast Network is a DNS server that you're going to use to map IP address uh, names, domain names to IP addresses. And then you also have a web server that you're going to connect to. And that web server is part of Google's network. Now, this web server has an IP address, 642331691105, and it's on Google's subnet uh, network, 64.233.160, subnet mask of 19. And so you start out and you're going to join the network. You take your laptop, you plug it in, you type into your browser, www.google.com or what have you, and then you get a web page from the web server. So a lot of stuff happens underneath the covers, and we have in this course, uh, now that we're at the end of the semester, more than enough to understand all of the pieces uh, that fit together that enable this to happen. And so you start out, you have your router, and let's imagine your router on your local network is running DHCP. So you plug in your machine, and that machine does not have an IP address. It doesn't know uh, the first hop router or the default gateway, and it doesn't have an IP address. It doesn't know any of this. It doesn't know either what the address is of the DNS server, so it can map names, domain names, numbers. So it starts out when it plugs in, it engages in DHCP. So DHCP sits on top of UDP, it encapsulates it in UDP, sends it down to IP through to Ethernet, uh, which does the framing. And this Ethernet frame is sent uh, via broadcast uh, to get to the DHCP server. So it uses the broadcast MAC address, which is all ones, all 48 bits. And this is now forward to the switch. It gets flooded. Uh, and one of the machines on the network that gets this broadcast DHCP query is this DHCP server. So the DHCP server gets it, it unwraps uh, that datagram, and it sends it up the stack to the DHCP server, and then that DHCP server sends back a response with this uh, allocated IP address, as long with the first top router and the address of the DNS server. So it sends that back down, and it gets um, broadcast back, and your machine picks it up, and then it unwraps that DHCP response, and then it uses it 
uh, to set its first hop router, knows the IP address for the first hop router, uh, it knows the address uh, for the DNS server, and then it also has its IP address. So now you're ready to communicate. So now, of course, before you send your HTTP request, you've typed in the domain name google.com. You now need to do a DNS query. So when you do this DNS query, you start with DNS. It goes in through UDP. Now, of course, you need the address of the first hop router. Because you know the IP address, you know it should not be on your network. It's going to go uh, to another network. So you need this first hop router, and you're going to acquire through your default gateway um, using ARP. You know the IP address of your default gateway because you got that from uh, the DNS response. And now you're going to use ARP to find the MAC address of your default gateway. You need the MAC address of your default gateway because you want to direct this DNS frame to your default gateway because this DNS's IP address is not on your network. And so you send out the ARP query, and you say who is, and you give it the IP address of your first hop router, which is your default gateway. Now, your default gateway, your first hop router, it answers with the ARP query, including the MAC address for this default gateway's interface that's on your same network. So you get this ARP reply, and you populate your ARP cache with an entry that has the IP address of the default gateway, or first hop router, and the MAC address for the first hop router. So now you know this destination MAC address, you perform the framing, and now you send this DNS query to your first hop router. So now the first hop router pulls this into its memory. It looks at the destination IP address, that's the IP address for the DNS, it sees which subnet it's on, looks up in its forwarding table or flow table, and then sends it out the correct um, output port. And that's the output port that gets to Comcast network. So it sends it to Comcast network. It's been running link state routing or distance vector routing. It knows to forward it uh, to the DNS server. And then that DNS server gets that DNS query, sends it up the stack. It then performs a query and sends back a response with the IP address. And so now that you have this IP address, you construct your HTTP request packet. Now, of course, it uses TCP, and part of TCP is the connection establishment. So you start out sending the SYN packet, and the SYN packet is to establish the connection. Now, this connection is with the web server uh, that you've gotten the IP address for, and you're going to send the SYN packet out, and it makes its way to the web server, now, of course, you know it goes to the web server because you know that the IP address for the web server is not on your network. And so you're going to use framing in the link layer of your machine uh, to send to the destination MAC address for your first hop router, which then examines the destination IP address, forts it out the correct uh, output port, and it sends it to the next router, goes to the next router, until ultimately it arrives at the web server. So the web server gets the SYN packet, and it establishes the resources it needs to engage in reliable data transport, and then it sends the SYN app. And so the SYN app goes in the reverse path, and all the routers along the way know how to forward it because the destination IP address is the IP address for that host that sent uh, the SYN originally. And so now, once that SYN app arrives at your machine, it sends it up the stack, and it knows that, okay, well, the web server has established the resources it needs to engage and reliable data transport. So now it sends the acknowledgement for the SYN app with as payload on the HTTP GET request. And so it sends that in the direction with the source address is your laptop and destination address is the web server. And so now it goes across the network, gets routed, it HTTP GET request arrives at uh, the web server, it sends it up the stack, it goes to the application layer, application layer is your web server, uh, and that web server parses the GET request. It gets that file system object for index.html. It sends it back in HTTP response. It goes back across the network, gets routed, because they all know through BGP and eBGP and iBGP what the paths are to get from router to router to router to make it back to your machine. Your machine gets the HTTP response. It sends it up the stack. That frame gets pulled into the network layer. Uh, it takes that datagram sends it up uh, through TCP, TCP buffers it in order, sends it to the HTTP browser uh, up above, it gets the contents of the website and renders it, 
and you see it drawn out as your web page. Now, the beauty of all of this is all of this stuff that happens from the time you plug in your laptop, you get your uh, credentials, your uh, default gateway, first hop router, your address of the DNS server and your IP address in a second or two, and then you type in www.google.com, hit enter, and all of this start to finish happens in fractions of seconds. It's the absolute beauty that is the internet, and you finally get your web page. Okay, so it took all semester to talk about something that takes a few seconds, which is kind of weird, but there's a lot of machinery involved, and now you have everything you need to understand all aspects of it. So with that, we have looked at principles of the data link layer uh, services. We looked at various technologies for the link layer, and then we ended, ultimately spent all 15 weeks of the semester getting to this point where we understand a day in the life of a web request. So with that, um, that's our done. We've completed. Congratulations. We've completed our journey down the five-layer Internet stack. We did not focus much on the physical layer. You could easily spend a semester or two just on the physical layer. But at a minimum, you have a rigorous and solid understanding of all the networking principles and practices, as well as tools of Wireshark for understanding how the modern Internet works. Now, of course, this is just the beginning. There are lots of interesting topics for which now you have a very strong foundation to continue. So you could go further uh, looking at uh, network security, looking at multimedia issues and applications, as well as wireless communication. Uh, so with that, we are done, uh, and we will stop there. That's all I had. And as usual, please stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you all on Tuesday.